On June 13th, 1977, counselors at a Girl Scout camp in Locust Grove, Oklahoma, woke up to an unspeakable horror. Eight-year-old Lori Farmer, nine-year-old Michelle Doucet, and 10-year-old Denise Milner had been brutally murdered. It was a crime that sparked a blaze of anger, mistrust, and mystery. Who would do such a thing? The little girls' bodies had been carried from their tent and placed approximately 100 yards away. Two were still in their sleeping bags, one was not. All had been sexually assaulted before their murder. Investigators put their clues together, including a flashlight left at the scene which had a dated newspaper wrapped around the batteries inside, and particles from the attacker's hair found on the tape used to bind the little girls. Camp director Barbara Day told Isaacs she had later learned of a note found by a camper earlier that spring, which supposedly contained a threat that four girls would be killed. Other witnesses told of a flap which had been cut from a tent the week before and of an earlier burglary at the camp dining hall. Dawn on Monday, June 13th, a counselor found three small bodies, still in their sleeping bags, piled near the so-called Kiowa encampment, changing the mood from happiness to horror. Three young girls, ages 8, 9, and 10, were brutally beaten, attacked, and killed by an unknown assailant. The evidence strongly indicates that the girls were attacked while sleeping in their tent, were sexually assaulted, and were taken from the tent and left some distance away. Officials quickly evacuated the other girls from Camp Scott by bus. Mays County Sheriff's officials and highway patrol troopers cordoned off the camp, and within hours, hundreds of other law enforcement officials converged on Camp Scott in search of clues and eventually a suspect. I would not have stayed in the tent Lori was in as an adult. I would not have stayed there. I would have been frightened. And as a, a parent of a child who was murdered, the hardest thing for me is to accept that I let her go into that situation. It has been 45 years since the horrific murders of three Oklahoma Girl Scouts. It has been called Oklahoma's most notorious cold case, but officials with the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation, the OSBI, say they are confident they know who the killer is. On June 13, 1977, investigators made a gruesome discovery at a Girl Scout camp outside Locust Grove, Oklahoma. On June 12th, just one day from the killings, Girl Scouts from Tulsa and surrounding areas arrived at Camp Scott in Locust Grove, Oklahoma. 100 Girl Scouts from Tulsa's Magic Empire Council arrived there Sunday afternoon for a week of outdoor fun. As the girls went to sleep for the night, a thunderstorm started to roll through into the early hours the next morning. when counselor Carla Willite heard something in the middle of the night. She got up to investigate. She heard an unusual moaning sound coming from the main road through camp. She stood there for a minute, decided there was nothing to worry about, so she turned around and started going back to her tent. Uh, as soon as she did that, with the light not being shined in that direction anymore, the sound started back up. So she turned around a second time started walking back that direction and as she started walking and the flashlight shined that direction again the sound stopped again so this time she decided it was probably some kind of animal so she turned around and went back to her tent and she said as she was falling asleep she could still hear that sound the next morning on her way to the shower house carla made a horrible discovery this was the beginning of a nightmare that would last decades as investigators try to uncover clues about the atrocious crimes committed at Camp Scott. The little girls' bodies had been carried from their tent and placed approximately 100 yards away. Two were still in their sleeping bags, one was not. All had been sexually assaulted before their murder. People of the tiny community of Locust Grove, through no fault of their own, are also suffering. That's because Locust Grove depends on tourism generated by the nearby Grand River. 
and ever since the murders, tourists have stayed away. Prior to the murders, there was suspicious activity happening at Camp Scott that raised red flags. One counselor reported finding a tent slashed open. Others reported having items stolen from their tents and hearing noises in the distance. One tent had been ransacked. Upon checking to see what else was stolen, they found a note with the words kill written several times all over it. A drawing used at the trial some two years later shows the configuration of the Kiowa unit. The little girls' bodies had been carried from their tent and placed approximately 100 yards away. Two were still in their sleeping bags, one was not. All had been sexually assaulted before their murder. Pete Weaver was sheriff of Mays County in 1977. He arrived at Camp Scott at 7.05 a.m. And at that time, for one of the victims, body I would, would estimate to be 70 degrees was still warm. The other two were in sleeping bags, and which had some protection from the elements. And from there, we started our investigation. It had rained the evening before the murders, just after the little girls had arrived at camp and had continued into the night. Sheriff Weaver says the rain helped authorities estimate the time of the deaths. I found a uh, hank of sash cord that out by in that general area that uh, was dry other than dew. So this would indicate that the crime was committed sometime after 11 o'clock, or that sash card was put there after 11 o'clock, because it had not been rained on. While law officers searched for leads, Mrs. Farmer, Lori's mother, learned that there had been other incidents at the camp prior to the night of the murders. And Mrs. Farmer says, had she known, she would never have allowed her daughter to go to camp. And it upsets her even today. If I had known a tent had been slashed, the night before Lori was to get on the bus to go, I would have never let her go. And when we got up there and saw the arrangement of the area, it um, is not the way we thought our child was going to be in a camp area. I would not have stayed in the tent Lori was in as an adult. I would not have stayed there. I would have been frightened. And as a, a parent of a child who was murdered, the hardest thing for me is to accept that I let her go into that situation. And I will never get over that guilt, ever. Meanwhile, investigators put their clues together, including a flashlight left at the scene which had a dated newspaper wrapped around the batteries inside, and particles from the attacker's hair found on the tape used to bind the little girls. Their evidence led investigators to believe that an escaped convict named Jean Leroy Hart was their chief suspect. Hart was a convicted kidnapper and rapist who had grown up in the area and who had been a fugitive for the past four years. Hart knew well the wooded countryside of eastern Oklahoma. He had hunted and fished the area all of his life, and he was related to many of the Indian people who live in the region. And among them, it was said that Hart was counseled by a powerful medicine man who had given him the ability to turn himself into a cat or a bird to help him escape his captors. This is beautiful country. It is also rugged country. The hills roll, the oak and blackjack are thick, and a man who knows the terrain can lose himself in here almost forever. Dogs were brought in from a police department in Pennsylvania to help in the search. A plane with a heat-seeking device was also employed, looking for Jean Leroy Hart and for his hideout. Uh, we had gotten information from a rel very reliable source that they were living in a cave. There were two of them that were living in a cave down in that area. And they say they stay at some friend's house until the police car comes by and they hit the brush and go up on this hill to a cave. Well, we searched this. Uh, at least three times, and we could not find a cave. One time we could, could smell smoke, but we couldn't locate where it was coming from. Well, what this informant didn't know was they were going across this hill and across a hollow to the next hill. That's where the cave was located. 
But we were looking in the general area, but we didn't have it, couldn't, couldn't find where the cave was at. And these is where the items are located from this camp. The cave Sheriff Weaver was looking for was accidentally found by W.R. Thompson, who lived nearby. He and his brother-in-law were out squirrel hunting when they stumbled upon it. Jean Leroy Hart was not there, but evidence was, evidence that would later be used at the Hart trial. And we found uh, what looked like where someone had been, been staying. It's what it was. There was a, a sack of flour. It's what really, it was in a bread sack, what it was. And uh, we, we picked it up, you know, and just curious. And I, we got to discussing, you know, if maybe it was something to do with this Girl Scout deal. And we decided, you know, we'd go up there and talk to him. And when we went back down there, when we found, well, there's pennies and uh, glass uh, for uh, glasses, you know, a case for glasses and some photos. And I see, some, there was some newspaper there. Now, at the time, you felt like it was pretty strong evidence. Uh, yes, so I, I really did. Now, you because, testified in the trial. Yes, I did. And at that time, you felt I, that you was... I, I definitely, you know, felt that he was, but now I don't. Meanwhile, the search for Hart pressed on from Mays County through Cherokee County on down into Sequoia and Adair counties, a landscape that over the years had hidden outlaws from Pretty Boy Floyd to Bell Star. Finally, after almost 11 months of looking, the manhunt bore fruit. These are the Cookson Hills, south of Tahlequah. This is where the long search ended, where Gene Leroy Hart was captured, living with an elderly Cherokee man named Sam Pigeon, who knew Hart as Drum. Hart was wearing a tank top and cutoffs when he was arrested and had gained some 40 pounds. The little girl scouts had been dead for nearly a year by the time he was tracked down. Jerry Weber, Channel 2 News. Over 40 years later, the case is still open. Investigators from the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation, along with the current sheriff of Mays County, Mike Reed, are still searching for answers. With the advancements of forensic technology, they are able to reanalyze key pieces of evidence, making great strides in hopefully identifying who committed this terrible crime. We have new information this evening in the 1977 Girl Scout murders that shocked all of Green Country and the nation. No one has ever been convicted, but investigators say new DNA testing has ruled out every single possible suspect except one. Three young girls, you'll remember, Lori Farmer, Michelle Gousset, and Denise Milner, were raped and murdered at camp in Mays County. Evidence was recently retested for DNA, and the results are now being made public for the first time ever. News on 6's Reagan Ledbetter has been working on this story for months and has this exclusive information. Reagan. Lori, Mays County Sheriff Mike Reed has spent the last nine years digging into this case after Lori Farmer's parents asked him to give, a, get a, the, uh, give the case a fresh set of eyes. Now, he says every single piece of DNA evidence has been accounted for, and he says there's no doubt in his mind that evidence shows Jean Leroy Hart is the killer. Jean Leroy Hart was arrested, then tried, and acquitted for the brutal murders in 1978. Sheriff Reed says DNA evidence wasn't available to the jury in 1978, but if it was, Reed has no doubt Hart would have been convicted. I pray that the family, there's something that we've done that gives the family a second of something that even resembles closure or acceptance or something. I pray that. But as far as peace, there is absolutely nothing about this case that has given me one second of peace, period. Reed says the facts go far beyond DNA evidence. He says Hart was a textbook serial rapist who had been convicted of kidnapping and raping two pregnant women 10 years before the Girl Scout murders. That's the kind of stuff that Gene Hart was responsible for. Hart was given parole after serving just two and a half years in prison for that crime. Sheriff Reed says the conspiracy theories surrounding this case over the years have been endless, and he agreed to look at this case for one reason, the families. Sherry Farmer has felt the pain of this crime for 45 years. She says she and her husband, Bo, have some peace, but there will never be closure. She spoke exclusively to me a month ago about that pain. Let's say journey I wouldn't wish on anyone. Oh, it's shocking. It's different than a death. 
it's different than a loss because our daughter was murdered. It was intentional. And she died with two other little girls that we don't want to forget either. Now, Gene Leroy Hart uh, died in prison just months after he was acquitted of those murders. He was in prison for another crime. So, Reagan, a lot of people are going to say, okay, so this evidence is finally conclusive. But they're not willing investigators just yet to call it closed. Now, why is that? Well, first of all, the sheriff wants to emphasize and make it very clear that everything has been tested. There's nothing else out there that hasn't been tested. It's been tested by the best labs out there. There's no new special DNA testing that would give them a more conclusive result. Um, as far as the whole cl case closed deal, they've decided that the DA's office, the sheriff's office, OSBI investigators, and the families, that's the most important thing, are going to have a group discussion and sit down and they want to come to a unified 100% decision to either close the case or leave it open. The concerns with closing the case is if somebody maybe has information out there and they don't want it to appear that the case is closed and nothing new can happen, but they're confident in the information they have. Okay, and this is just a small look at what you've been working on for months. So when are we gonna see this real, more of this? Yeah, I'll have a much more in-depth look at this investigation, the evidence, um, and even into Gene Leroy Hart. Um, Sheriff Mike Reed spent a long time looking into his past, and I'll have much more on that coming up Monday night. Monday night, we are looking forward to that. Thank you, Reagan. Hey, what is up, you guys? Tonight, we are hitting a huge location I've been wanting to hit for a couple years now. This is Camp Scott outside Locust Grove in Oklahoma. And it is an abandoned Girl Scout camp, but it's not just an abandoned Girl Scout camp. Something horrific happened here. In 1977, three young girl campers were tragically murdered here in their tent. And ever since the tragic murders, this place has been closed. So it's absolutely crazy. And besides that, it is also known as one of the most haunted places in the state of Oklahoma. As you can see, we're heading down the old road that led to the camp. As we are heading down the old road that leads to the Girl Scout camp, I just thought this was pretty cool to point out. It's like a very old vintage real estate sign that was just left here. And maybe one time there was like a property here or something. Or who knows, maybe it's for the Girl Scout camp itself. So we're actually entering from the back of the park and after walking about a mile into the woods, we have finally came across the Osage. And um, I'm not really sure what this building was used for. I'm assuming it could have been tickets or ticket sales or something. It's crazy to think that this place has been closed since 1977. Someone's been in here. Got a kitchen here. Even got one of those old Kenmore uh, stove ovens. So again, I'm not really sure what this Osage building would have been used for. Some nice brickwork around the uh, fireplace here. This is like one of those, I don't even know. I don't think this is supposed to be here. I think this is totally unrelated to the fireplace, but that is really beautiful. I'm sure it was insanely beautiful back in its day. So we just came across two buildings and we're not exactly sure how the trail goes. We're trying to follow a map of when the camp was here and it's really hard to follow the trail just because of all the overgrowth and everything. So this might have been one of the lodges or Chickasaws, I'm not really sure. Most of these structures are just uh, corpses of what they really were back in the day. Here is the Great Hall, 
and this would have been like a food dining place and I think the kids would also do dances and stuff in here and um, from pictures this place looked stunning um, it's sad to see that someone burnt it down happens way too often with abandoned places and just places that get out there like publicly it just it sucks you can see a lot of the burnt broken glass And right behind, or in front, I should say, whatever way you're coming, there will be the swimming pool situated right next to the Great Hall. And we're coming up on it right now. Here is the swimming pool, which is absolutely giant. I did not expect it to be this big in person. I mean, this thing is huge. This could be a public pool, honestly, in like a small town. You can still see some of the paint on the floor of the pool, surprisingly. So like I said, we started at the back of the camp and we're gonna make our way back through and go to the spot where the three innocent girls were tragically murdered. Bear with me as there is a ton of overgrowth and it's hard to make out exactly where stuff was, but I'm gonna try to do the best I can. You can see right next to the pool, there would have been an outhouse here. It looks like uh, most of these structures were made out of brick. Fortunately, or if they weren't, I don't think any of this stuff would be here today. So right here is the cook's cabin. And um, this place doesn't look as destroyed as some of the others. So we're gonna try to see what's inside here. So this would have been the cook's cabin. Holy. So I'm not really sure if somebody lived in here after or what, but there's a bunch of movies left here. And um, yeah, this place is completely gutted as you see. Here's the director's office. And as you guys can see, looks like the roof has caved in on itself, unfortunately. But there is this little post right here, and there is a very vintage photograph when you can see the Oklahoma State Police parked right next to this wooden post. And obviously, all this brush and everything was not here. It was all cleared out, but that is the same post from that picture 45 some years ago. So I think this is where the ranger's house would have been or the health center. It's kind of hard to tell, like I said, but there was definitely a structure here. If you look a little bit further, you can see some burnt concrete over there. Now we're on the way to the location where the bodies were actually found. And again, it's gonna be a little tricky to exactly pinpoint the location, but I'm pretty sure I can find the general camping area. All right, guys, so we're here at Camp Scott, and uh, we're going to do a little bit of paranormal investigation. I haven't seen too many people on YouTube do this, but um, we trekked all the way out here. Like I said, it was about a mile walk into the woods, so I want to make the most out of it. This was a definitely a cool place, but yeah, let's get into this. Can you cross the rods if Camp Scott is really haunted? Can you make these rods cross if Camp Scott is truly haunted? Shoot. Let's say that's a yes. I'm trying to be as still as possible, by the way. 
Can you make the rods on the cross, please? Can you make them straighten out? Can you straighten out the rods, please? Looks like it's taken a lot of energy. Slowly but surely, just straightened back out. Now, I'm trying to be so still. Is Camp Scott really as haunted as people say it is? Cross the rods for yes. That was a pretty quick one. Can you make the rods uncross, please? Can you uncross the rods? It always does this. It's very slow, but it somehow happens. Now, the dowsing rods don't always work at places, though. Like, I've tried them at a lot of places, and they just don't move whatsoever. All right, guys, so I found a spot in the shade where I'm gonna use the spirit box to try to ask some questions. And um, actually, once I turned on the spirit box, I actually got some pretty weird responses without even saying anything. It said five very clearly. And it also said something else, but that was before I turned on the camera, coincidentally. We're just gonna ask some questions on the spirit box. We're gonna see, is anybody here at Camp Scott? So I got the PSB7 here, got it hooked up to a speaker. Let's ask some questions. Is there anybody here with me at this abandoned camp tonight? Is Camp Scott really haunted? How many spirits are here at Camp Scott? Zero down. That was a really clear female voice. No clue what it said. Some of this stuff comes in so fast that it, it just goes right over the top of me. It's, it's crazy. I never actually thought I would come out here to Oklahoma to investigate or explore Camp Scott, but here I am. So I really hope you guys are enjoying this video, enjoying the exploration and everything, the investigation, because I really put my heart and soul into this episode and I really hope you guys enjoy it as much as I enjoy putting all this together and making all this for you guys. So um, yeah, thank you guys for tuning in and watching this episode. I just want to say that because I can never thank you guys enough for watching my content and supporting me. It absolutely means the world. I heard another, I heard something else right there. It's like a deep voice. I have no clue what that was. some weirder stuff coming through. What is your name? Who is communicating with me right now? I heard that same voice before. It was like a deep male's voice, which doesn't really make sense, but um, you guys know that spirits take on, or demons I should say, take on the identity of dead people. So it could be a case of that, I don't know. Or it could be a random voice. The, um, the spirit box is not 100% guaranteed paranormal evidence. It's a device that is made to communicate with the dead, but is not always 100% accurate. Was there only three deaths here? 
Or was there more? You hear that? How many? How many deaths? Are you an evil presence? Are you an evil presence? Of course, like right as I ask the question, something comes through. What is your name? Do you like it when people come here to visit? Are you a boy or girl? I heard a woman's voice there. Hey, what is up you guys? That is gonna wrap up today's video. I actually did not film an outro when I was there at Camp Scott. I really hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I really try to make it the best it possibly could be from the editing to the exploration and everything. I do wish the investigation was a little bit better, but I do now have a REM pod by the way, so the next investigation is gonna be amped up and that's gonna be really cool. And I can't wait to film that for you guys, but I really hope you guys enjoyed tonight's episode. Leave a like, comment of what you thought, and subscribe to the Ghost Files if you haven't yet. And I'll catch you guys next week. Peace out. June 13th, a counselor found three small bodies, still in their sleeping bags, piled near the so-called Kiowa encampment, changing the mood from happiness to horror. Three young girls, ages 8, 9, and 10, were brutally beaten, attacked, and killed by an unknown assailant. The evidence strongly indicates that the girls were attacked while sleeping in their tent, were sexually assaulted, and were taken from the tent and left some distance away. Searchers were hampered by the tremendous size of the search area and dense brush and trees.